Um, I'm going to talk about what's new with custodial HTK. We know cardioplegia is a very hot topic, just as ECMO is. You've seen a lot of ECMO talks, and if you go to various conferences, you'll see cardioplegia um, talked about significantly. Um, I work for Essential Pharmaceuticals, so that is my disclosure. I am a perfusionist. I still practice perfusion. Um, Essential Pharmaceuticals uh, is a distributor of custodial HTK. They don't manufacture custodial, so I make that distinction because it's a little unclear uh, with our, our company's name. People think that we actually manufacture it. We don't. So I just want to talk about custodial HTK. I'm going to breeze over this since we're running very late today. It's an intracellular solution. It's the opposite mechanism of action of every other cardioplegia that's available on the market. Uh, here's what a traditional one liter bag of custodial uh, HTK looks like. And HTK, the H in HTK is histidine. Um, histidine is a powerful amino buffer and we just saw a great talk about the inflammatory response. It does a, a phenomenal job at abating that. Sorry, my, this screen keeps going blank on me, so I don't know what, can I go back? Yeah, so here's, here's what HTK will do, the histidine will do for you. It will buffer the pH in an environment. And if you can see the top line here, this is custodial HTK, and this is you know your basic Buckberg 4 to 1 cardioplegia. And you can see that it's going to stabilize that pH uh, in an anaerobic environment. Here's the ischemic time of 60 minutes, 120. And so this is why you can take uh, HTK two hours out without having to give another dose with the traditional protocol. And typically I go over that protocol, but that protocol is listed on perfusion.com. It's not uh, a proprietary protocol. And then the T is tryptophan. It's an amino acid. Uh, I mean, it's a... Uh, membrane stabilizer. It just facilitates the uh, ion transfer in and out of the uh, membrane. And then the key to glutarate is just having that energy substrate. It's available right when you take the cross clamp off. Uh, you'll have that energy source available and it's a great nitrogen scavenger. And then we have a high concentration of mannitol and we all know the effects of mannitol. But interestingly enough, it's purported that its greatest uh, effect is during an ischemic insult. And when we put the cross clamp on, that's exactly what we're doing. We're creating that ischemic insult. So what a better time to have a high concentration of mannitol in a solution. And it's got that oxygen free radical scavenging ability. So I used um, custodial HTK for many years at Temple University. We 100% every case. And here are some of the things that I saw as a clinician when I was using custodial. The low uh, viscosity al allows for um, even distribution throughout the myocardium. It has reduced potassium levels. And at the time I was using this, Del Nido wasn't a very popular um, solution for adult cardioplegia. So, you know, it was nice not to have to do a, deal with those high potassiums. Um, superior buffering capacity and compared to blood. You know, our blood has two millimoles of histidine naturally occurring. This solution here has 198 millimoles of histidine. So terrific job of buffering. Um, and there was only one recognized protocol, which was terrific. So every surgeon at our institution used the same identical protocol, and so did the perfusionist. So there was no guessing every case, what are we going to do, how much volume are we going to give, when are we going to redose. The protocol was exactly the same. And so we had the same results. And then no, no additives, no compounding. You just took it straight from the refrigerator, hung it, and you delivered it. It was straight crystalloid. So at Temple, we did have our, a fair number of emergencies. You just pull it right out of the fridge and go, and uh, it was terrific. And it has a one-year shelf life. So we, we never destroyed custodial HTK. Um, just never happened. So the cost savings of that alone was uh, significant. And we had a cold agglutin protocol. So, you know, when you get those rare cases of cold agglutin and you're using any type of strategy that employs blood, you're not going to be able to cool the myocardium. But with custodial HTK, when we had a cold agglutin patient, we could cool the myocardium and protect that patient. So uh, just getting into the meat of what we wanted to talk about and what's new with custodial, um, looking at long-term outcomes, that's, that's not often studied. I said cardioplegia is often studied, often presented. 
but we don't really see a lot of studies that look at outcomes one month down, you know, out of surgery. So that's what I, I want to kind of paint a picture of what uh, some of the research that Dr. Gnaiden has been doing, um, and I got permission to, to present his data here at this talk today. So he wanted to look at uh, first in the laboratory um, at his particular institution, a high volume institution. I think they did 4,000 cardiac procedures annually, um, huge. He had all strategies available to him, custodial, blood cardioplegia, and Del Nido. And he wanted to, to figure out which strategy that was available to him actually produced the, uh, the greatest effects long term for his patients. So he, he took a look at, uh, you know, custodial. He took a look at uh, blood cardioplegia. You can see it all. Plegisol, Del Nido. And what he saw, interestingly enough, looking at this long term, you can see the, the results, and this is for adult cardiac patients, is that, you know, two hours post, you know, post-test, things were pretty, pretty normal and pretty, uh, not, not a whole heck of a lot of difference. But when you start getting six hours out, 24 hours out, 48 hours looking at cell you know, viability, then you can see it really starts to make a difference here. And so yeah, that, I think that was the first time that we've seen this kind of work done, looking at what's the effect of what we're doing intraoperatively long term on our, our patients. And then another one, same, same type of test, and again, the results panned out exactly the same where two hours, not much difference, six hours starting to see some difference, but a day, a day out of the culture. And look at the, look at the outliers. Oops, I'm sorry. Look at the outliers. I mean, significantly uh, better results utilizing custodial HDK, and, and, and that's the histidine. That's, that's what we're seeing there. And then neonatal. This is why Del Nido was formulated for pediatrics. And the results here show it. 24, 48 hours, the neonatal cells were just as viable with the Del Nido as they were with the custodial. But when you go backwards and look at the adult, the adults didn't do so well. They are, it's a different, uh, it's, they're different cells at that point. And so this, this bears out that it's a great solution for pediatrics, developed for pediatrics, and maybe, I'm not saying it is or isn't, but maybe it's not as, uh, as good as what it is for the uh, pediatric population. So after he validated in the lab which one in his mind he thought was a, a better solution, he wanted to take a look at it um, in the actual clinical setting. And so he put out a study looking at long-term protection, taking a look at high-risk coronary patients, and bas basically looking at 100 um, in each arm of a Del Nido, HTK and blood cardioplegia. This is four to one blood cardioplegia, and this is one to four Del Nido, so the original Del Nido formulary. And delivering them um, the Del Nido and the HTK at the exact same rates, exact same intervals, to make it as, uh, as uniform as possible. Obviously, the blood cardioplegia, he had to give you know, a little more frequently just because the, the nature of the solution. And uh, here, here, none of the patients had any uh, statistics statistical differences between the, uh, between the patients. But here's one of the interesting finds out of this particular study, and this is looking at interleukin-6 levels. And the uh, first column were, was the baseline, and the second one was immediate, immediately coming off cardiopulmonary bypass. He measured blood at the coronary sinus, direct coronary sinus measurement. And you can see there is some, some slight variability with the uh, Del Nido group compared to the HTK and blood cardioplegia group. And you can see the outlier was, you know, very much higher. And then looking at syndicin 1 levels, same blood measured. And we know that syndicin, high syndicin 1 levels indicate a deterioration of the glycocalyx. So that means the glycocalyx is starting to break down. And again, after, oops, I'm sorry. I keep wanting to use the laser. You know, Right after we come off bypass, you can see those levels rise significantly. And then I guess this is how it translated out in actually looking at uh, the clinical outcomes. And the thing that stuck out to me, even though it's not highly significant, 
clinically significant, is the atrial fibrillation. We had eight patients in this arm, and four of them converted to permanent AFib. We had four over here, and none of them converted to permanent AFib. And we know how expensive treating AFib is. I think a recent article I saw is around twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 just to treat AFib postoperatively, so pretty expensive. And the IC, ICU stay is a little bit higher, and length of stay is a little bit less. So, so those are the uh, numbers that stuck out to me. And then this one it was just looking at all kinds of um, episodes of any kind of rhythm issues. And again, we see the atrial fibrillation is the one that sticks out to me is having 10 of those 19 uh, converting to permanent AFib. And then this was a one month follow up of all these patients, which was very interesting. You don't see the one month follow ups on, on studies that are out there. I don't see very many of them, but the atrial fibrillation in the Del Nido group, again, and the tachycardia higher. And I think that speaks to the uh, protection, long term protection of uh, custodial HTK. And there's his conclusion. And the problem with, you know, the Del Nido cardioplegia in his, this first particular study is that there was the um, thought that maybe you could go 90 minutes with Del Nido. And so I think that created some of the variability here, but he has since um, changed that to, to 60 minutes. So then the next um, evolution of, of the uh, logical steps is, okay, these are single dose techniques. And again, looking at 90 minutes for the Del Nido group and thinking, yeah, this is probably a little too high, but does redosing cardioplegia have any ill effects on, on patients? And so basically, he put out a similar study, and there you go. And he used the same type of, uh, same type of study arms that he did in the uh, previous study. But just looking at the single dose techniques available, the Del Nido versus custodial HTK. And what's very, you can see he bolded it in red, redosing Del Nido cardioplegia had significant issues with uh, postoperative afibrillation. Um, higher, definitely higher interleukin-6 levels, definitely higher syndicin-1 levels when redosing as compared to just giving one single dose. So redosing cardioplegia does not come without um, some risk, as, as we can say, see right here. And here's some of the, uh, like I said, the uh, IL-6s. Look at the redosing group. Again, much higher than the initial dose of cardioplegia. Actually, in both groups, even the custodial was a little bit higher in redosing. So redosing definitely does not come without its, its risks. Same thing plays out here with the syndicate one levels. Redosing obviously um, elevated those as well. So we think that you know, giving extra cardioplegia and giving an extra dose is, is going to create some uh, increase of osmotic pressure, and, and, and that could translate to some of the issues that we're seeing. So, so then COVID hits right in the middle of all this research, and at his particular institution, just like everybody else, beds were scarce, patients were on ventilators, and so he, he kind of wanted to reimagine what he was doing in his, uh, with his techniques to try and optimize um, patient throughput to minimize the, the amount of time that patients were on ventilators and recovery in the ICU. So what he decided to do was take a look at um, how he delivers custodial HTK. And he decided that um, in trying to expedite these patients, most of his cross clamp times were less than 60 minutes. And traditionally with custodial HTK, you can often give, you know, in the traditional um, arm, you could give up to two liters in the initial dose. Since his chloroscope times were 60 minutes or less typically, he decided to take a look at half that dose, taking a look at utilizing just one liter of custodial HTK for chloroscope times of an expected less than 60 minutes. 
And so just wanted to make sure that it was safe. He already had a study arm um, well in place and, and got clearance to do so. And this was the uh, dosing technique that he gave. And, and again, four to eight degrees centigrade, up to one liter. Um, and, and then subsequent doses, he would give half of that. And, and of note here, and I didn't, all of his patients received retrograde in, in this um, fashion. So he'd give two thirds anagrade, one third retrograde for this low dose uh, protocol arm. And, and it yielded pretty good results. Um, very similar to the, the results that he was seeing in the previous studies. Um, and this bears out in the uh, data here. And again, he did use, uh, did compare to all the modalities he had available and just gave one liter of del nido cardioplegia. And again, the interleukin-6 levels uh, played out again a little higher in the uh, del nido arm. So he concluded that it, this was a, a safe and effective way to try and um, minimize the uh, amount of time in surgery and try and optimize uh, patient throughput. And then from there, um, I provided feedback because I'm going all across the country. I'm looking at what all institutions, what they do, what their feedback is. And one of the things that uh, we uh, talked about was how about modified custodial? There's modified Del Nido, and there's not a lot of studies that can do direct comparison to modified custodial. Here's the protocol for it, giving it just one to four. So one part blood, four parts crystalloid um, HTK, delivering it uh, similarly as he did with a low, low dose protocol. And again, why even consider modifying a solution that's working so well? Direct comparison. Now we can actually do apples to apples comparison of original Del Nido. We can do prospective data and finally get some you know, good studies out there that aren't just retrospective data. Um, so very important to, to get that out there. Here's some of the early data and, and work from this. A paper is going to come out in SAGE probably August to September, um, looking at all of the data. But one of the feedbacks and, and even another reason to consider modified is that if you've ever used 100% crystalloid, as you push all of the blood through this coronary system, it can bleach out the heart and, and give that you know, almost white effect. And it can sometimes make it difficult to trace the targets. And, and so with that little bit of blood in there, that makes those targets just pop. And so typically I, um, in, the early, uh, in the early phase, he's just using this for cabbage surgery right now. So if he's doing valves, he'll stick with the original clear crystalloid low protocol. But if he's got a cabbage patient, he'll use this new modified protocol. So I, I went through it quickly to try and get us back on schedule. Um, I'm going to be here to uh, take questions. I have all of, his, all of his work. I have some other papers available, too. So if you'd like a copy of some of these papers, there's my email. Hit me up, and then I appreciate your time. Thank you.